Hai guys, welcome to DMKP Visipol UGM channel. My name is Rafa and today I will be guiding you guys through my undergraduate thesis study entitled The Analysis of Green Open Space Policy, The Case of Public Parks in South Jakarta. So if we take a look at it here, this park actually currently illustrates the proportions of parks in South Jakarta. At a glance, you may not see any problems with it, but in this presentation, I will be showing you guys what is really the issue surrounding green open spaces in South Jakarta. So just to give a brief overview of the study, green open spaces in Jakarta is mandated under law number 26 year 2007, which states that the proportions that each city should have is 30% with 20% owned by the public and 10% owned by the private. However, green open space policies have become less and less ambitious in the courses of the years as the targets kept on decreasing. It is also important to note that Jakarta is very unique due to its past status as a capital city, meaning that not all green open spaces that is located in Jakarta is actually owned by the city government, as some of them are owned by the national government. So this thesis actually used three sub-questions, which are what are the policies in Jakarta city regarding green open spaces? Second is what are the challenges in implementing the green open space policies in the perspective of stakeholders? And lastly is how has the urban sustainability index and the aspect of green open spaces been implemented in South Jakarta city? So just a short short summary on why I chose to use public parks, South Jakarta, and urban sustainability. So parks itself is not a passive green open space which allows areas that are not restricted and allows activation within its surroundings. Hence, it allows the ability for us to investigate the urban sustainability index. And lastly, uh, South Jakarta is also the designated area for green open space development as we can see in the past history that this area was filled with greenery and it's actually uh, one of the very few places in Jakarta that still allows for green spaces to be more developed. The research gap of the study is that most studies on green open spaces is actually based on the technical, spatial aspect that is more quantitative in nature. However, it is important to connect the aspects of qualitative uh, social uh, policies with the technical aspect because uh, these policies itself should actually just be connected with one another. It is a multifaceted uh, problem. Uh, green open space prioritization should also increase as it is becoming a mitigating uh, strategy for the government to tackle urban problems such as flooding and overpopulation. So this study uses a theoretical framework that has been developed here used to operationalize the questions uh, in the research questions of the study. So if we can see here at the top, we can start with the green open space itself. It is followed by four main aspects that are reduced to evaluate the conditions of green open spaces and parks, especially in South Jakarta. These four main aspects are made up of accessibility, secondly is the proportion, next would be inclusivity, and lastly is the aspect of vulnerability. All of these sub-aspects then reflect the existing policies and the current status of green open spaces in South Jakarta. But in order to determine this further, the study utilized two sources. One is the user-based perspective to garner the perceivement of citizens regarding green open spaces in Jakarta, while the other one refers to the management or the stakeholders or the people who have interests or people who are familiar with the management, with the implementation and with the planning process of green open spaces in public parks in South Jakarta. So this information is then all generated to identify the challenges faced by green open spaces which then results to the conclusions to be made into recommendations. The study uses a mixed methodology which utilizes three research approaches that are used to operationalize the questions of the study. So the first research here is an in-depth interview in which I interviewed seven different individuals with different backgrounds to represent the stakeholders involved in the planning, the implementation, and management process that is related to green open spaces to get a deeper perspective and cover the technical expertise side of the information. The second approach used is a dust study utilizing secondary data in order to grasp the conditions that require the technical expertise regarding the matter. Doing so will also allow for a better understanding regarding the government documents regarding the policies. Besides that, the study also utilized a spatial interpretation of geographic information system using a software called Quantum GIS that allows the study to get a visual representation of the open source data available uh, provided by the government. Lastly, the research approach utilized a questionnaire survey in which uh, 16 individuals currently residing in South Jakarta with four representatives within four age groups which are Boomers, Generation X, Millennials, and Generation Z is interviewed to, in order to get a triangulation measure to make up for the missing user-based information 
from the interview and the death study. Doing so allows for a better understanding of the extent to which the policies have been implemented in South Jakarta. When asked regarding the challenges faced in terms of green open space in its planning, management, or their implementation process, these were the 50 terms that came up the most according to the software program of NVivo, which is a qualitative analysis software that analyzes these words into these word clouds. It is then reorganized into a four main umbrella terms that are depicting the challenges faced by green open spaces and public parks in South Jakarta. So first is costs, which generally depicts the inability for them to acquire land as well as to have an adequate management system due to the lacking financial support they have. Secondly would have to be distribution, which refers to how green, existing green open spaces are not located equally in locations and it's not fully filled the targeted proportions. This also contributes to how it is very challenging to develop new green open spaces in already existing built environment like South Jakarta that is already uh, densely populated. Thirdly is governance, which is also seen to be umbrella term, referring to how they have their challenges in the principal role of planning, regulating, and providing public goods. And it shows how they sometimes lean to a more urgent and politically prominent projects, especially with those with more economical incentives, uh, which may take precedence over the allocation of attention to green open spaces. And lastly is accessibility. In theory, green open spaces should actually be public and needs to be open to everyone so the challenges here is to complete the facilities that can accommodate them well as well as putting a safety consideration ensuring their seamless mobility journey. Going back to the aspect of proportions, here we can see that there, there are several living standards which reflects the ideal proportions a city should have based on its size and percentage. So based on the World Health Organization standards or the WHO, we can see here through the calculation that South Jakarta is missing approximately around 13,044,796.082 square meters of uh, land used for green open space. So according to James et al. 2009, accessibility has become a major indicator used to evaluate the effectiveness of ecological and social functions that prevail within an urban area. This map was actually illustrated using the software program of Quantum GIS. If you can see here that some areas like Jagakarsa, they have one of the biggest parks in South Jakarta. However, it is just focused in one single area and not distributed equally amongst the surroundings. Meanwhile, if we compare it here to the area of Kabayaran Baru in which they have much smaller parks but they are more distributed equally. So we can see here that there is a disparity between uh, the areas in South Jakarta. It should also be noted that the current developments and the future developments of green open spaces in South Jakarta is actually built according to transit-oriented development in which they use approximately 350 to 700 meters distance of green open spaces to each transport hubs that are located within the city. Next is the aspect of vulnerability, which is actually not mentioned explicitly in a lot of these uh, policies, but it's also an important aspect to be considered due to the mitigative functions that is integrated with the role of green open spaces in urban areas. So while flooding is not the only natural disasters that comes around in Jakarta, especially South Jakarta, it is definitely one of the most common natural disasters. So Article 45 here actually affirms the role of green open space to function as a temporary water storage when high rainfall is at its peak. This is especially relevant due to the land subsidence of groundwater extraction due to the influx of population in recent years and the rise of water seawater levels happening due to the climate change. Therefore, its existence is actually necessary. However, if we take a look at this map right here, it is actually showing how these parks are actually not strategically placed as they are not adjacent to the river water flows. Besides flooding, Jakarta is actually prone to other natural disasters like fire and earthquakes. Inclusivity has become the main concerns of public parks in South Jakarta. However, it is important to note that all of these parks actually needs to be accessible to all layers of society. But it is important to note that some people belonging to vulnerable groups and communities like children or elders and disabled communities needs their rights to be protected and mandated by the law. This is why there is the creation of some parks like RPTRA, which is child-friendly integrated space, and Taman Maju Bersama, which essentially fosters good development for people's well-being. 
In theory, both RPTRA and Taman Maju Bersama actually serves a good function of being inclusive by providing adequate facilities. However, in practice, most users have found that its conditions do not actually fully reflect the aims of the parks itself. Therefore, some of these parks actually develop the methods of social mapping and social engineering to get a better grasp on what the community needs and how they can foster a more supportive space. The main problems are mainly found in how most of these users don't actually feel safe while visiting public parks. This is due to the lack of facilities like ramps for wheelchairs, lighting for night times, and maybe a clean and proper pedestrian way, which shows that not all of these parks are inclusive, accommodating for those belonging to vulnerable communities. So the conclusion of this undergraduate thesis is that green open spaces policies have historically lacked prioritization, with an emphasis on quality over quantity. Despite recent improvements, negative perceptions still actually prevail due to the lack of enforcement, hindering the achievement of targeted proportions over the past seven decades. Based on the findings, the study actually suggests some policy alternative recommendations. This study recommends a change in policies that govern the proportions and existence of green open spaces. So while a set percentage of the 30% can actually serve as an enforcing factor, the actual implementation has actually not been reflected in the desired numbers. Therefore, a shift towards a focus on quality rather on quantity should actually be considered first. Despite that, quantities should also play an equally important role in the general sustainability aspect, especially relevant in tackling urban problems. The second recommendation would have to be an alternative management of green open spaces autonomy that is defined by a centralized policy and a decentralized system to allow for a better planning, implementation, supervision, and inline expenditure system to increase efficiency and localization of the policy. Lastly, the study recommends that there should be a competitive policy which offers incentives to increase collaboration with private sectors or state-owned enterprises to surface from the problems emerging from market mechanisms like the lack of fundings and the rise in land values. Thank you for tuning in to this presentation. See you on the next video.